Amen. Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Amen and amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of uh, St. John chapter 1. St. John chapter 1. And uh, when you get to St. John chapter 1, let's look at verse 6 through 9. I... Um, I dropped a bomb on y'all last week when I told you you're not the light of the world. <laughs> and I, I felt like what I need to do is kind of back up a little bit and teach you into this so that uh, you won't get in trouble with your mama and them talking about, don't tell me I ain't the light of the world. I know I'm the light of the world. You might not be the light of the world. Uh, so that we can, we can see this. But I found a statement I, I wanted to really start off with tonight. And it says that the first fundamental message of those who witness grace is not a message of condemning sin, but of proclaiming that sin is taken away by the Lamb of God. And we have to understand that it is by Jesus alone that it's taken away, that man contributes nothing to it, that this grace is of the fullness of Christ. And upon this grace, there is also grace for daily living on this earth. And there is grace that's going to be revealed at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with that in mind, <clears throat> I want to talk to you tonight about walking in the light. What does that mean? I have heard over the years so many misinterpretations uh, and references concerning the light. And, and, and we need to find out contextually what this means. You know, when you, again, when you take things out of context and just kind of kind of go with it, it you, you end up in all kinds of weird places. And the one of the reasons why we're talking about the book of John in, in context is because John prophetically saw a lot of amazing things about the grace of God out of all those who wrote the gospel. I tell you, John really tapped into something, you know. You can see why Revelations, God could use him for that book as well. He really tapped into this. So, Let's look at St. John chapter 1 and beginning at verse 6 and 9, and we're going to look at this, this area of the light. Verse 6 through 9, verse 6 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this John he's referring to is John the Baptist, okay? Not John the, the writer here, but John the Baptist. He says, The same came, John, came for a witness and John was to bear witness of the light. All right, now we know that the light here is referring to Jesus Christ, okay? And he was sent to bear witness of the light that all men through him, all men through the light, believing in the light, might believe. And John the Baptist was sent to bear witness. He said he was not that light. John the Baptist was not that light. Okay, but John the Baptist was sent to bear witness of that light. See that pretty clear, right? He said, uh, that was the true light, referring to Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, you, you, you automatically know that you're going to have to rightly divide the word when you read this in John, and it's very clear that John the Baptist, that man was not the light, but here's, here's something that's even more important. Jesus 
is referred to as the light. Now, under grace, man is not the light of the world. And that statement is so important. Under grace, he is not the light of the world. Only the word that was with God, that's Jesus, and the word that was God, that's Jesus, is the light of the world during the age of grace. Now, I've said something so amazing here because we're talking about now uh, in, in the grace dispensation that no man, man is not the light. And we, we heard it very clearly as John began to foresee this, that Jesus is that light. Now, the reason why I say it is I'm going to take you to a place in the scriptures in Matthew 5 where it sounds like the contradiction. And you remember I told you we've got to start dealing with the contradictions. And right now, I, I feel like I'm on a roll. I'm trying to find every contradiction I can find and resolve the contradiction. And, and my, you know, me doing that, you know, now I'm controversial because I'm dealing with the controversy, all right? The contradiction that's in the Bible. But go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 and 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 16. I thought about this last Wednesday. I said, my God, I just dropped that on everybody and left, you know. <laughs> like, what? We ain't the light? I, what, I, <laughs> what about this? I, you know, let your light shine. That's what we're getting ready to read. <laughs> Don't shine your light. Let it shine. And we made a song, let it shine, shine. This little light, light of mine. That was my best song, favorite song, you know. Now watch this, Matthew 5, 14. Look carefully. You are the light of the world. That's already a contradiction to what we just read in John. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Ah, all of, ah, ah. Now notice now, let your light shine before men so they can see your good works. So this light and good works are going together here. Let your light shine before men so they can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All right, now, if we look at the dispensation of grace, it is not our good works that glorifies God. It is our belief in him that glorifies God. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. This was a condition under the law and that the good works were the works of the law. It's, it's, it's very clear here. The good works, these are the works of the law. Someone says, how would you say that? Well, in verse 17, just move right on down to verse 17, Jesus is talking about, I have not come. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, okay, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill. So right there, he's telling us that in context, this good works. Let your light shine so that men might see your good works and glorify God. That is not true under the dispensation of grace while it was true under the law. And so in, uh, under the law, God was glorified by the good works of man. But under grace, all witness must be concerning the light. Under grace, everything is about Jesus. Under grace, everything is about the light. Under the law, it was the good works of men that glorified God. Under the grace of God, it was the light. It was the Son of God. And it is definitely cautioned to us that man is not the light. We see that in John chapter 1 and 8, he came to be a witness to the light, but Jesus is the light. The Son of God is the light. Now, you see why it was necessary for me to talk to you about that, because, you know, your mom and them going to go get the Bible and say, see, there it is right there, Josephine, right there in Matthew chapter 5, I am the light of the world. And that's why we, we oh my goodness, it, you understand why I teach homiletics on Sunday morning, because we have to rightly divide the word of truth. What was true under this, uh, 
this uh, dispensation of the law may not be true under the dispensation of grace. What was true under the Old Testament, it may not be true under the New. For example, the Old Testament, the Bible talks about in Hebrews 10 and 1, the shadow of those things that are to come, all right? Well, most of the Old Testament is nothing but shadows that point to Jesus. Somebody's got to be responsible for casting a shadow. I'm working on a sermon now called Jesus the Shadow Caster, amen? He's the one that casts the shadow. And the illustration I want to give you is that in the Old Covenant, you see people talking about the Sabbath. And the Sabbath in the Old Testament represented a day. But then you come over to the New Covenant, and it says that the Sabbath is no longer a day. The Sabbath is Jesus. Jesus under the New Covenant is our Sabbath. So if we're going to deal with the contradictions, we got to make sure we understand how to rightly divide between what happened and what was true before Jesus went to the cross and what is true after he went to the cross. We've got to understand what was true uh, when you're dealing with shadows versus what the shadows pointing to in the old covenant. We've got to understand what is true under the dispensation of the law versus the dispensation of grace. And when you can rightly divide those, you can easily rectify situations right here that we're looking at, and you don't get confused. Now, think about when you didn't understand what I just explained to you, and you understand that. Now, think about what you would have done with somebody saying, you are not the light. And you said, yes, I am. Matthew 5 says, I'm the light. And then, they, and then somebody says, no, you not. John chapter 1 say he the light. You still follow what I'm saying? And then there's a split because of the light. <laughs> now we got Jesus is the light, Christian center. <laughs> and I'm the light, Christian center. That's how all of that started because we didn't understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. You, you got to understand that, and, I, and, I, I, and I'm looking at this uh, I, I finally found a scripture. That's why I, I got a book that I've been working on for three years. I didn't release it because I couldn't find the, this, this, this particular scripture, and I found this scripture that plainly said that you do understand that everything that was written so far is not everything. <laughs> that it was just information from right there, but it's pointing to what is getting ready to happen. You don't have the whole story now. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is a progressive revelation. You first see the shadow of Jesus as all the shadows eventually point you to the one who's cast in the shadow. All right? Melchizedek was a shadow. He was the high priest of the Most High God. That was a shadow or a signpost pointing to Jesus, our high priest. Jesus is our Melchizedek. So when we read the Old Covenant, we've, we've got to, all we got to do is follow the shadow pointing to Jesus and then back up and you begin to, to, to see what you need to see here. Now, I did want to take this a little, a little further. Since we're talking about the light and, and, and we know who the light is, look at John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12. Now, this is interesting here because now this is going to be dealing with your performance versus, you know, who Jesus is, who is the light. All right, now verse 12 says this. He says, then spake Jesus again unto them, and look what he said, I am the light of the world. My gosh, did you see that? Huh, did you see that? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? <laughs> Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. No, you the light. No, you, you the light of the world. <laughs> well, is you or is you not the light of the world? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? He spake, Jesus again said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of what? Life. Okay? So today we don't need to be afraid of his light because when we enter that light in the new birth, the new birth is how we enter that light, we enter Christ himself. So basically, when we enter that light or we enter Christ or the day we get born again, we enter that light. Now, that light does not expose our sin. It reveals the perfection 
of the blood of Jesus in taking our sins away. The light doesn't expose the sin. The light reveals how the blood of Jesus has taken your sins away. So you have to be careful because we love to use human illustrations to try to figure out God. And they're not working here. Well, we're going to shine the light. You better watch out. The light going to shine on your sin, and then we're going to... No, he, he don't need to shine no light on your sin. He already know your sin, right? But when you enter in, when you get born again, you become a Christian, you've entered into the light You're, because Jesus is the light, okay? And then when you enter into Jesus, who is the light, you don't have to be afraid of the light exposing your sins because what the light is going to do is reveal, glory to God, the power of the blood of Jesus and how he has removed your sins. And what happens is you become enlightened to the grace and truth that, that, that happened to you when you got born again. Hallelujah, praise God. All right, now, so in John chapter 8, verse 12, you see this phrase, shall not walk in darkness. You see that? Shall not walk in darkness. I was so blown away. For the believer who is in Christ. Now, those, those of you who are born again tonight say, I'm in Christ. And to be in Christ also means you're in what? You're in the light, right? Say, I'm in the light because I'm in Christ. All right, now. For the believer who is in Christ or in the light, I'm going to say something that's really, really strong and controversial. It's cool. Truth is controversy. You understand? Just because something's controversial don't mean that it's wrong or it's bad, but truth by itself is controversy. And, and, and here it is. Once you're in Christ, once you're in the light, it is impossible to walk in darkness ever again. I mean, y'all easing into the, ha amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. If you say so, Reverend, praise Jesus. Hop, hop, hallelujah. I tell you, I had the same reaction, and I couldn't stop right there. I'm like, okay, hold on. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so I'm saying to you that you who are in Christ, it is not possible for you to ever again walk in darkness. Now, we still sin, but we will never be in darkness again. Think on that a little bit now. Now, 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 now again, let me, let, me, let me turn it back on you. you. I dare you to act like you shot when I say we still sin. N uh, <laughs> you are getting better and you are growing and your state is catching up with your stance every day of your life because of the Holy Spirit. He's taking desires away from you that you used to have. You are on a journey and you are being successful because of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But you're never going to walk in darkness again. You're in the light. How can you ever walk in the darkness when you're in the light? You're never going to walk in darkness again. That old man, you'll never walk with that again. That's gone. That's gone. You're not perfect. And that's the thing I say to people who want to be judgmental of other people's sin. I want to like, okay, how was, you, how was your last week? Well, I ain't did the Big Ten. Yeah, but you did the teeny winny 20. Bad attitude, a white lie. Come on, sin is sin. Stop it. You're getting better because of Jesus. You're living life better because of Jesus. Amen? But you will never be in darkness again. Now, I realize I've got to explain that, and I'm prepared to do that tonight. Go back to 1 John 1 and 7. 1 John 1 and 7. Yeah, we're still not perfect, but we will never be in darkness again. Y'all like to hear like that, right? Yeah. Because somehow the church has convinced you, you know, when I say you, you, you still sin, well, we're not supposed to sin. You know, e every imperfection in your life is an imperfection of sin that by the Holy Ghost and by you being in Christ, 
he is walking you out of. You no longer have a nature that wants to sin. You have a nature that wants to do right. You have a nature that wants to live holy. You have a nature of God, glory to God, a new creation. On it. Whereas before, your nature was to sin. You don't have that nature anymore. You're not serving that sinful man anymore. You'll never have to serve that sinful man anymore. Your nature is a nature of Christ. Praise God. Now, 1 John 1 and 7, he says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Boy, you got to know how to put this stuff together. Because now you, you get confused just reading what he's talking about. Look what he said. If we walk in the light, if we walk in the light. Now, first of all, when I got born again, I'm in the light, right? So if you walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> his son, cleanses us from all sin. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if we have a performance work mindset, and we, have, we see a phrase like this, we'll automatically assume it's talking about behavior. Again, it's rightly defined to truth. You automatically assume, because under the law, it was all about performance. It, it was a self-performance. The law was a performance-based agreement, all right? So if you read this right here, and you automatically think, well, this is performance or work. If you walk in the light, as he's in the light, then you have fellowship with So you're thinking walking in the light is going to be based on your performance, okay, and, and on your works. If you have a works mindset, you see this phrase as, you know, uh, and automatically assume this is about your behavior, your behavior, behavior. But this phrase is not referring to how you, we walk. He says if you walk in the light. He's not referring uh, how we walk. He's not talking about how we walk. It's referring to where we walk. Let me say that again. It's not talking about how we walk. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have to, he's not talking about how we walk. He's talking about where we walk. If you walk where? As he is where? He's talking about where you walk. Hallelujah. Not how you walk. To say, now look at this and see how I touch, I, I'll show you why this doesn't work. To say that it's talking about our behavior would not make sense. Why? It would mean if we behave ourselves like Jesus behaves himself, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sins. Now, why would we need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us if we behave in like Jesus and Jesus is perfect? Think about that now. If we walk in good behavior as Jesus is in good behavior, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sin. If we behave like Jesus, we wouldn't need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us of our sins. So you, you, can't, you can't apply your performance or your work mindset to this scripture. That's not what he's talking about. But for, for a, lot, a long time in my Christian life, that's what was used to talk about my behavior. And it was saying, all right now, brother, all right now, what you just did there, now you got to walk in the light. He's not talking about it. See, the, my problem, the one reason why I didn't behave right, because I, I, I wasn't walking where I was supposed to be walking. I was, turn, I was concerned, concerned about, you know, my behavior when it was talking about where. It's not how we walk, it's where we walk. And if we'll walk where we walk, then that will straighten up how we walk. Are, are you listening to me? Now, uh, if it's talking about behavior, then basically what he is saying is, when I behave right, I'm in the light. And when I misbehave, I'm out of the light. Behave right, in the light. Misbehave, out of the light. Think about how that looks. Think about how they make God look. You know, I see you today. How you doing? I'm in the light. I see you on Sunday. How you doing? I'm out of the light. But praise the Lord, I'm working on getting back in the light. That ain't God, bro. 
That ain't God. You, you, you will never be in darkness, not another day in your life. You understand? You are in the light, and it is impossible for you to be in the dark again. <laughs> all right, now, now I got to explain all that. I know. This scripture is talking about the, the realm we are in as believers, not the way we are performing. We are in the light because we have been cleansed from all of our sins. We're in the light because we've been cleansed of all of our sins. Glory be to God. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. Well, wait a minute. If I still have some areas that I'm being perfected in my life, and I've been cleansed of all of my sin, when I sin, am I dirty again? And need to be cleansed some more? And I'm dirty again? And I need to be cleansed some more? Dirty. Clean some more. <laughs> dirty. We, 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 that's how, that's what religion tells us. And I tell you, there's, there's, there's so much bondage. That's why people quit. They save one year, and next year they're like, I just can't figure all this stuff out. Yeah. That's why you hear people say the Bible contradicts itself. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. There's something wrong with men who don't know how to rightly divide it. Okay? Now, let me show you two scriptures real quick to, to look at what we're talking about here. Look at uh, Colossians 1, verses 12 through 14. Colossians 1, verses 12 through 14. Rightly dividing the word of truth. In Colossians 1, 12 through 14, verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or made us able, okay, to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints, where? In the light. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness, because we're in the light, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption or deliverance through his blood, and we even have the forgiveness of sins. All right? That's what it said, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to break all that down in a minute. Is, is that what it just said? Yes. Okay, but can you see what happens when you don't know how to rightly divide it? You're absolutely confused. And as soon as you miss the mark or walk in an imperfection that, 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 that the Spirit of God is working with you on to get rid of, the condemnation comes back in, the guilt comes in, the shame comes in, and you start stepping away from your real identity, and now you're starting to, de you're starting to define who you are based on how you behave. Now look at this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> Now, verse 9, he says, but you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of what? Darkness and called you where? Into his marvelous light. Verse 10, which in times past, we're not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy at that time, but now they have obtained mercy. Mercy is the bad you deserve, you don't get. The judgment and the condemnation you deserve, you don't get, not from heaven. The throne of grace is the safest place for you to be, praise God, and to stay. Now, if you are a believer, you are in the light because you're in Jesus, and Jesus is the light. And you walk where God is because you are in Christ and because he is in us. Now, in, in 1 John 1, 7, you notice the word cleanses, that he cleanses us. Go, go there real quick. I want to make this point. I want to play English teacher just for a moment and then let you go. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, how is this word used originally? Please forgive me. I don't want to bore you. But 
the word cleanses is in the present active indicative verb tense in the original Greek language. For us, it just simply means in the present tense. This word means that the blood is effective right now forever keeping us in the light. This is not the blood that he, he, when he says, uses the word cleanses, I don't know. He says cleanses, but we think cleansed. Past tense, it cleansed the sin that we had up until that moment we got saved. Okay? And, and, and I know people that have never dealt with this before. You remember, you, you, you know, what was that? Three weeks ago I taught on uh, sinning after salvation. For you, probably, I mean, it wasn't, big of a, it wasn't a big a deal. You've been here for a minute, those of you have. But for folks, can you imagine people, the first time they sat there and they went through all those scriptures and said, oh, my goodness. But when you look at the tense, and that's, that's how I use the scripture. I like to go, when I, when I question a tense, what is this? Is this once that was happened? But it, it happened once for all time. So even in Hebrews 10, when it says, it, 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 we, we've been cleansed by the blood once for all time. That means that blood has, is still present tense working yeah. right now. What he did one time is still working for all times. Glory to God. So the present tense means that the blood is effective right now forever keeping us in the light. This is because our spirits are in Christ completely holy, our spirits are in Christ, completely protected, and the blood of Jesus has forever, forever separated us from that nature of sin. Forever. You are forever. Forever separated from that sin nature, and you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit you are separated and protected. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Now, <clears throat> again, somebody says, well, you know, are we perfect? Well, a third of you is perfect. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a physical body. This is not Creflo Dollar. This is the house that Creflo Dollar lives in. When I pass on, my body will be in a box or something. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get into the bottles. It'll definitely be in a box or something. And my spirit and soul will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now, my spirit was the part that got born again. My spirit was the part that entered into the light. My spirit, man, the real me, is in Christ right now. My spirit, man, right now is heaven ready. That's the only part of you that goes somewhere when you die. Your body ain't going nowhere but back to the dust or the dirt. Your spirit, man, is the real you. When I see you, Wow. I, I just had a thought. May I have the privilege of just sharing with, with you this thought I just had. I just saw it real quick go past my, my uh, mind. You remember when uh, they were talking about the earthly tabernacle was actually a, a, it said it came from the heavenly pattern. So the, what you saw on the earthly part tabernacle said it came from the heavenly pattern, uh, tabernacle. And I was thinking about our spirit. Uh, you know, I told you Jesus is the shadow caster. And real quick, I saw, I saw this. My spirit man has cast the image of my physical man. So when I see you, I'm going to know who you are. Because you're, uh, something had to cast this image. Yeah. Did, did y'all see what I did? What? Yeah. Somebody had to cast this image in. Somebody asked me, well, will we, know, will we know one another when we get to heaven? Well, will I know you when we get to Texas? <laughs> you, you, you absolutely will. 
You absolutely will. I always thought about that. But it won't be your body. You'll have a, you're, 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 the real you has a spiritual body. Glory to God. So it can exist in a spiritual world. But then when Jesus comes back, the, the trump will sound, and the, the dead in Christ will rise, and your body, however you're going to do it, I don't know. It's good sometimes for the preacher to say he don't know. However he's going to do it, we are going to put on a glorified body, uh, kind of similar to what Jesus demonstrated, that has authority in two worlds. Jesus walked through the door, the door being shut. Then he sat down after walking through a door, the door being shut, and the scripture says he ate what? Fish and honeycomb. How you walk through a door and still now have the ability to comprehend physical, natural things? Are, are you listening to what I'm saying? This is going to be an amazing thing. And so, while the world, chaos is going to increase in the world and debates are going to be increased, I'm over all that. My job is while all that going on is to the glory in the church to build us up until you have such a relationship with Jesus that all you thinking is Jesus and you're going to have peace in the midst of turmoil, that means you can be in trouble and it not bother you. Because I still think stress is the number one creator of dis dis disease and sickness. I think diseasement in your, in, you know, not casting your care is going to produce physical diseasement. That's why you got to figure out how to live a life of ease and peace. Amen. You got you know, all the stuff that bothers you all the time and it stresses you out. You got to figure out. You got to. You got to. You got to figure out how to deal with that, or that's going to deal with you. And, and, and I know, I know my family kind of tripping out sometimes because I don't let nothing bother me now. I look at it and then I have to talk to myself and say, you know, that's all right. You, you know, that'd be all right. It'll be fine. It'll be, it'll be okay. You know, oh, there's a hole in the wall. It could be fixed. You know, oh, I wrecked your car. We can get another one. I got insurance. No way am I going to allow myself to get back to what I was going through, and the wisdom I bought out of that three-year uh, Job uh, period is to learn how to live a life of ease and peace. Okay? Learn how to live a life of ease and peace. And remember, this Christian life is about living it. You're going to see the power of God operating in your life more as you start living with Him, a daily walk with Him, not you live this way and then put God over here to church and you ain't got nothing to do with God until you come to church. And No, no, no. As I live, I practice these things that I'm learning. As I live, uh, and what I was going to get into tonight, I don't have time to get into it, but I was going to talk about, and we'll talk about it next Wednesday, that this man who is full of grace and truth has to be received. He has to be received. How do you know if you've received Jesus? Because you keep putting yourself in situations where you have to depend on him. And I say, on purpose, put yourself in situations where you have to depend on him. Because really, there's only one big command in the New Testament. Believe him. <laughs> yeah. Love and walking in belief with him. He said to this guy, we want to do miracles like you. He said, the only thing I want you to do is to believe in the one that I sent you. That's what I want you to do. And we don't really know how to do that. We think believing is conjuring up some energy to say I really believe it. But <laughs> believing is, is demonstrated and authenticated when you continue to, on purpose, put yourself in a position where I depend on God. I sat yesterday and just meditated for some, 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 some strong, powerful minutes. Show me where I have put myself in a position to depend on you. Because I don't want to just be around spontificating. This ain't nothing I just want to talk about. And then we can have revelation parties. Well, I got a revelation. Well, you ain't heard my revelation. 
The only revelation I'm, 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 I'm concerned about is the revealing of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about your little education revelation, okay? And ask yourself that same question. Am I positioning my life in total dependence on him? If so, you have now ventured into what believing is all about. It's not mental acrobats. I depend on God. And Abraham absolutely demonstrated that. Check Abraham out. You know, Abraham, like, I can't have no kid. I'm dried up. And, and my, my wife can't have none. But you said we're going to have one, so we're going to have to depend on you for that. All right? Versus Ishmael. Ishmael was born out of natural. Abraham could still make babies and who he was with. What was her name? Hagar? She made one. But when it got to Abraham, old age, and Sarah old, it wasn't nothing they could do to help God, but depend on him. My question is, can you exa examine your life and ask yourself, am I putting myself in a position of depending on God? You have the answer when you want to know if you believe. Am I depending? Or... Am I still weaving in self-performance? Am I still bringing stuff to the table and then go out and articulating, yes, I believe God, but you're not talking about all the stuff that you've done. So actually, I don't know if that was, you know, from God or not. I started locating a lot of areas where I made stuff happen because I didn't depend on him to make it happen. And when you depend on God to make it happen, here is the evidence that you're totally dependent on God. You're at rest and at ease and at peace. So when you find yourself getting out of rest and out of ease and at peace, what's actually going on? You have fear that what God promised won't come to pass. And you're not dependent on it. That was real to me. I mean, I, was, I, I put my notes and Bible down and I said, let's Let's talk. Hear the words of my heart. I need to make sure I don't need to go on a fast because I have a lot of areas that I'm, I need to examine. Have I positioned myself to depend on you? Or have I positioned myself to depend on me? Self-preservation instead of God preserving me. May not be a big deal to folks, but when I go to heaven and see Jesus, I kind of don't want to sit up there feeling kind of ashamed because I'm like, I ain't really believe in you like that. I believe you was real, but I didn't believe you as the one full of grace and truth. I didn't believe you as the one that would give me grace upon grace in my everyday life. And that's why I thought this teaching was so important tonight that you know that you are, it's not about, you know, your behavior, but about where you are. And you're never going back into darkness again. It's never, you're never gonna, you're not ever going back to darkness again. You're never going back to entertaining, you know, that, that sin nature again. Yeah, but pastor, you don't know what I did last night. You're in transition. You're still the righteousness of God in transition. Be careful now because we live in a world where what goes around comes around and sin, sinning still has some natural consequences that may come with it. I mean, you cool with God in, in heaven because your spirit man is perfect. It doesn't sin and it doesn't desire to sin. But you still live in this place where they have earth suits and you still got to renew your mind to get rid of that old software that came from that old sin man when you had him there. And so you got born again here, but you still not renewing your mind there so you can kind of get that mind to line up with that new creation. So it's going to require a renewed mind to be able to do that. And then once your mind is being renewed and your body is, I mean, your soul spirit has been made brand new, then your body just going to do what it's told. 
it may have a, a shake a little bit because it's, it's kind of addicted to doing what it's wanting to do. But, but you can't, you know, if you got your spirit and your soul, you got the, you got the spirit man and the computer up here lined up, your body just going to, it's going to have to do what it's got to do. That's just like a hardware, uh, after you programmed the software, trying to fight uh, not doing what it's supposed to do. Do what it's supposed to do, then I'm going to throw you away. You, you're going to have to do what you got to do. And you'll be shocked when you realize the stuff you used to desire to do. One day you will sit back and say, how did that happen? I don't even want that no more. I don't even have a taste for it anymore. It don't do nothing for me no more. And then out of habit, you'll go and, you know, let me go pick this thing up, see if I still get high. <laughs> and then you go out and you're like, I don't even want to do this. I don't want to do this because I'm in the light. And, and he's so precious to me, and, and, and I love him, and I want to please him. And the Bible says, he will give you a desire to do what pleases him. And you're going to want to please him. And every day you wake up, you're going to want to please him a little bit more, a little bit more, much more, much more. Much. Next thing you know, is everything's about Jesus. And nothing's about you. And we end up the same way we did last week. Most important five words ever, behold the Lamb of God. And in order to do that, you got to stop holding yourself. See, I thought that was the trumpet that was coming, that little thing I heard. I thought, we getting ready to go. We getting ready to go. Boy, come on, Jesus. So if it's going to get darker and darker in the world, it's going to get lighter and lighter in the church, and I want to be a part of this great impartation and this great glorious visitation, a glory to hit this planet like it's never seen before. Amen. And it will be because there will be a people that have made a declaration of dependence upon him. You'll never be in the dark again. You get anything out of that teaching tonight? Never be in the dark. Father, we, we, we thank you and we ask you to help us to confront the contradictions that we see, lead us and guide us through them. Let us see you, Jesus, in everything. In everything concerning this word, somehow it, it deals with you. Let us see that. And I pray the blessings over these precious people of God, both here and online, that you will do such an amazing thing in their life. Lord, transforming them into the very thing that you've called them to be. And I thank you for that right now. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and say amen to that word. Come on and give God praise for that word. <laughs> Don't you feel like the light went off again? Like again, again. Praise God for that. And what a powerful time, even in this moment, to really look at where we are believing. This is a wonderful time to give and to have our offering. There are so many ways to give, and you can see that on the screen right there. You can raise your hand, and the ushers will minister to you an envelope, or you can, uh, world changers will be the thing that you text to 74483. Or you can call the number on the screen, 1 866 477 7683. You can even mail it in, 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia. Or the website is there on the screen. What an awesome opportunity to be able to sow our seed, to be able to say, Lord, I believe, I trust you in every situation and every circumstance. Giving is our response to the fact that, you know what, Lord, I know you got me. I know you take care of me in every single area of our life. You know, that believe thing, isn't it getting more and more and more of a situation where you have to put that thing in play? Like, wait a minute, do I? I, I believe. <laughs> you don't even have a choice in many situations. Lord, I have to believe you. There's no plan B. Amen. Let me pray over the offering. Father God, thank you so much for the seed that we will be able to sow. We ask that you grow it, Lord. We increase it in every way, Lord God. We give you praise in advance for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
And before we go, for those of you that are online and even sitting here in the sanctuary with us, if you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart, I believe your word. I believe that you are Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross. And man, even the words that we heard tonight, yes, about coming and being where we are in the light, that thing is serious right there. We want to give you that opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart, say this after me right now. Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that your blood was shed for me. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart now. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen. If you said that for the very first time, the very first time, we want you to know that you are welcome to the family. Can you give them a big hand right now? You could do better than that. Especially, especially after what we heard tonight. We're so excited about that. And if, again, if this was the first time that you've ever said, Jesus, come into my heart, we want you to text the keyword, I'm saved, I am S-A-V-E-D, to 51555. Amen? Powerful. Well, let's stand to our feet and receive the blessing on tonight before we go. Just lift your hands in the air. Just first of all, just say, thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord God, to come into your word. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace. We thank you for your peace. Lord, that you would take every person that is in this room safely to their destination, Lord God. And so we pray now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the almighty God. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever, in Jesus' name. And all that agree, said amen. Amen. You are dismissed. A room filled with brilliant minds. Women gather to share and learn. Seeds of knowledge ready to bloom. Ideas blossoming as we discern. Experts, students, leaders alike, each with their own light to shine. trauma in the name of Jesus that's trying to snuff out your garden. There is something you felt on the inside of you that built strength within you to give you the courage to go out and do what he has signed you to do. Could you consider cooperating with the plan? Since he has done what he has done. I'm more than a conqueror. Greater is he that's on the inside of me than he that's in the world. When you begin to call those seeds that be not as though they were, by his stripes I am healed. But you have to make up your mind, I am ready, I'm not scared. You will not have my marriage. You will not have my mind. For we are not under the law, ladies. We are under grace. Are you ready to bloom?